Hello, my name is Nathan Snow. I'm a research biologist at the USDA National Wildlife Research Center. Uh, this study is part of a larger overall effort that we're doing to develop a sodium nitrite toxic bait for wild pigs. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to start out by acknowledging all my co-authors listed here that helped conduct the study and the main collaborators of this overall effort are the USDA, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Texas A&M University Kingsville, um, <clears throat> AFLA has provided some funding. Internationally, uh, we work with Animal Control Technologies Australia, which is the bait manufacturer, the Invasive Animals Cooperative Research Center in Australia, and a company called Conovation in New Zealand. So <clears throat> we're, we're testing a sodium nitrite toxic bait. And the reason that we like sodium nitrite in a toxic bait is that it's acutely toxic to pigs. Most pigs are found dead within 100 to 300 meters away from a bait site, but some are found even closer than that, as you can see in this picture. It's humane. The mode of action is similar to carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, it's called methemoglobinemia. Uh, most pigs are dead in two to three hours. It's a food product, so we know a lot about sodium nitrite, which helps with knowing what the human risks are. And uh, this helps us when we're uh, going for our EPA registration. And lastly, uh, pigs are, are highly vulnerable. We originally thought that they were uniquely sensitive relative to other species, but our current research is showing that, um, that there are quite a few species out there that are sensitive just like pigs are. The product is called Hogon. Um, on the left is, is the original Hogon that we were testing. It's 10, it was 10% sodium nitrite. Uh, we were testing it in a bucket. It came in a bucket. Um, the latest formulation that we have is 5% sodium nitrite. It comes in this nice little tray that you just pull off the top. And uh, it's a peanut paste based bait. A little more on the sensitivity of different species to sodium nitrite. <clears throat> Here's a graph showing the LD50 values on the y-axis. LD50 is, is essentially just a measure of sensitivity. It's the amount of sodium nitrite an animal would need to consume to kill 50% of animals in that group. Um, and you can see by the red bar here, pigs are essentially right in the middle of, of all these animals that we have data for in terms of sensitivity. And then the numbers of the, above the bars represent how much hog on each of these species would need to consume to reach that LD50. And uh, I'll just point out um, a few numbers here that are, are really, really small. And, and these are what are causing us some issues. Um, for, for small birds like a zebra finch or a red winged blackbird, um, we're talking just 0 0.03 grams or 0 0.2 grams of, of hog on, which is essentially just one little bite for these birds. So because there are um, some non-target animals that are sensitive to sodium nitrate, we've developed some ways to keep them away from hog on. The first is a bait station um, that keeps its lids locked using about 30 pounds of magnetic pressure. And pigs are strong enough to, to break this pressure, but most other non-targets aren't. The only other ones that we um, have to worry about are black bears and we're developing a different bait station for them. Um, if there are livestock in the area, we build fences, just three strand barbed wire fences around our bait sites and the pigs can get underneath of them, but the livestock can't. Um, one thing, so we can protect the bait pretty well from non-targets, uh, but one thing we can't stop is this, a pig that eats like a pig. You can see this, this one pig here by himself is creating a huge amount of spilled toxic bait outside of the bait station. and um, and so then that spill bait is, is available for non-targets to eat. So we've made some modifications to our bait and baiting strategy to try to reduce that bait spilling. First of all, we put in 50% less sodium nitrate. So now we have a 5% product. Uh, we put thicker micro encapsulation around the sodium nitrate to hide it better. And both of those things are to try to increase the palatability for pigs. So they eat it rather than spill it. 
And then lastly, if they do spill it, we wanted to reduce the attractiveness to non-target animals. So we took out some of the cracked grains and just replaced it with grain flour. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, we've changed how we're offering the bait to pigs. On the left here, you can see the first time we offered it, um, where we took it out of buckets and put it into the bait station, we, we crumbled the bait up and kind of spread it throughout the bait station. Turned out that was um, made it really easy for pigs to spill it. So, uh, so in the middle picture, we started hand compacting it into just little separate trays in the bait station. And this worked a lot better for reducing spillage, but it was pretty time consuming for us. And so um, on the right here is our latest uh, version of how we're offering the bait. We put in those, those trays that are nicely compacted. Um, and then we put that metal bracket over the top so the trays can't come out. And it's, it's really easy to do. You just pull off the, the plastic top of the trays and slide them in. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some of our previous results from studies with hog on. Uh, here's a, a summary table. <clears throat> the first study in Texas in March of 2018, this is where we crumbled the bait and uh, we were using the original 10% hog on. We had, 10 bait, or we had 14 bait sites. We found about a thousand grams of spilled bait outside of the bait stations at all of those bait sites. That was the average of a thousand grams. Um, we did have good mortality in pigs. Uh, we killed 109, which was 66% of the population. Um, but unfortunately, this is where we discovered we had a real non-target issue. Um, we found almost 180 dead non-targets and 120 of those were white crowned sparrows. So uh, we, really, um, we really found that we needed to, uh, to do some mitigation to, to make sure we weren't killing those small birds. So in between um, Texas and the next study, Queensland, is when we did all those modifications I just talked about on the last slide. And, we, um, and so then we went to Queensland to test to see if we've made any improvements. We have 14 bait sites in Queensland. Um, we only found 55 grams of spilled bait. So that was almost a 20 fold decrease in spilled bait, which was a huge success, we thought. We still had good lethality for pigs. Uh, we did still find three Australian crows, um, but it sure was a big improvement over uh, what had happened in Texas. So we felt um, good enough to come back to the US and test in Alabama. We had five sites that we tested in um, August of 2019. Uh, we had good lethality for pigs. We found uh, we took out about 78% with just one night of toxic baiting. We did find two dead possums. <clears throat> Um, and so then we decided we should go back to Texas in March of 2020 to compare with what happened in March of 2018. We had five bait sites. Uh, we found about 30 grams of spilled bait around the bait sites, um, which was pretty similar to what we had in Queensland. We had good lethality for pigs, um, but we still had a problem with these small birds, mostly dark-eyed juncos. We ended up finding 35 uh, dead birds. And so this is where um, we're kind of left scratching our heads. Uh, we're doing a good job killing pigs. Um, and we have what we think is pretty minimal spilled bait, but we're still having too many non-target mortalities. And just to give you an idea of um, size of spilled bait, uh, a golf ball weighs about 45 grams. And so we're finding pretty much less than a golf ball amount of spilled bait out there. Um, and it's all broken up into really small particles. And so, as I said, we were scratching our heads and we started thinking, why are we having this continued issue, issue with birds? Um, and this is the reason we think. <laughs> we generally deploy our toxic bait in the late afternoon uh, and, and pigs come in usually sometime before midnight, we're finding, to consume the toxic bait um, and they kill themselves uh, by doing so. But in the process, they spill little um, small particles of the bait. In the early morning, uh, sometimes even before first light in the morning, we're seeing birds show up at these bait sites and they're eating those spilled particles of bait. And so by the time we show up, after we maybe checked a couple of bait sites and we finally get to this one, um, it's too late. Those birds have already had a chance to consume the toxic, the spilled toxic bait. And so then um, why we're seeing such huge uh, 
problems in March in Texas, we think is because of migratory birds. When they're, um, you can think about uh, these birds just sitting in a grassland in March, just waiting for the weather to warm up so they can move north. And they're sitting there and they're hungry. So they're really attracted to our bait sites. And we think that this really increases the risk. So uh, this is our question. How do we stop this? How do we stop all these birds from coming into our bait sites? Uh, the morning after we're done toxic baiting, we only have, that's the, the few hours um, of an issue that we have. So right after we were done in Texas in 2020, we came back to Colorado and we started testing some bird deterrents. And it worked out quite well because uh, those birds essentially followed us north. Um, we had juncos and sparrows here in Colorado with us in April. Um, so we were testing the same species that uh, we were having issues with down in Texas. So we tested four different deterrent treatments. The first is a chemical spray, methyl anthranolate. We sprayed it on the ground. Second is an inflatable scarecrow. This is called the scary man. He pops up every 17 minutes and, and, um, and waves around a little bit. Uh, the third one is a mesh grate. We thought maybe if we could put the bait station that we have on top of the grate, any spilled particles of bait would fall through and be unavailable to the birds. And then lastly is the scare dancer. Um, think of a used car sales lot. Um, the guy that's um, getting air pushed through him and he's flapping all around a long tube. Um, that's essentially what this thing is. <clears throat> so we had five bait sites for each treatment. And we also had five sites as controls. Uh, we baited birds with bird seed here in Colorado. Then we tried to deter them with, um, from the bird seed just for a single morning where we activated our deterrent device. And uh, this would sort of simulate our to uh, toxic bait deployment. Um, we used time-lapse imagery from remote cameras to compare the number of birds that we saw um, per every two minutes, pre and post activation of each deterrent. And so the, what we found is that uh, we only had two, two of the four treatments seemed to deter birds pretty well. The first was the metal grate that seemed to scare the birds away. And even if they did land, they weren't consuming the bait. We had an 86% reduction in bird visitation. And then um, the scare dancer worked the best. We had 96% reduction in bird visitation. And we think that works so well because it's, it's continuously moving around um, in a pretty erratic pattern. And it actually makes kind of a snapping noise as it's moving around. So it's got audio and visual uh, frightening in it. And uh, <clears throat> so we, we were um, trying to decide which to go forward with. And we started thinking, well, maybe the metal grate could be problematic if hog on stuck to the top of it. And indeed we did a little testing and we pretended to be pigs and we spilled some hog on on top. And unfortunately the, the hog on does stick to the top of it pretty good. Some does fall through, but enough sticks to the top that we think it would still pose a risk to non-targets. So um, we, we scratched out the metal grate and we started moving forward just with the scare dancer. So we took the scare dancer back to Texas. Now it's July of 2020. And we wanted to test it at some real toxic bait sites where we have pigs and birds. So we went to the same study area that we were in in March. Um, it's about a 13,000 acre pasture with cattle on it. Uh, the methods are we pre-baited pigs for about 10 days. Uh, we had five sites that we deployed the scare dancers at in five sites that we did not use the scare dancers. And we activated the scare dancers at about 5.20 in the morning, which was about an hour and a half before sunrise. Um, and we only activated them the morning after toxic baiting. So we kept them novel to all the animals um, prior to activating them. And uh, here's just a picture of, of what those look like when we showed up the morning afterward. You can see they're moving around pretty good. I don't think you can hear the snapping noise they make, but it's pretty loud when you're there. 
so the results from that study, um, from all 10 of our bait sites, we did a really good job. We, um, we killed, uh, we found 139 pig carcasses. Um, we know we killed more than that. We just couldn't find them, um, which turned out uh, we had a 91% reduction in pigs in, in just one night of toxic baiting. We did find some dropped bait pretty consistent with what we had been finding. Um, we found an average of about 23 grams. For non-targets dead, um, we found zero dead uh, at, at sites where we were using the scared answer. At sites without the scared answer, we found two dead rodents, a plains pocket mouse and a deer mouse, but no birds at all. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we looked at the species that were visiting the bait sites and we found that the scared answer was 100% effective at uh, keeping non-target animals away. So on this graph, the y-axis is the number of birds that we saw per five minute time-lapse image between those hours of 5.20 in the morning and noon. Uh, and we monitored for three mornings. So we have pre-toxic uh, bait deployment, posts or during toxic bait deployment, which is when we activated the scared answer and then post. And um, you can see from the red circle, during the hours that we activated the scare dancers, we had zero visitation to the bait sites by non-targets. Um, and pre and post, they were there. So we know that we were scaring them away. So the conclusions from this, um, from these sets of studies are that we don't think it's possible to fully eliminate dropped bait when you're feeding a group of pigs. Um, there is just, there is always going to be some spilled bait, um, it's, at least with the current formulation and the ba baiting strategy that we're using now. Um, so we're going to have to use the scared answers to deter non-targets the morning after toxic bait is offered. Um, it's a little bit more of a hassle uh, when you're out there. It's just one other thing to set up and maintain, um, but they don't cost very much. They're about $100 a piece, and you have to buy a 12-volt marine battery, which is also you know, close to $100. So it's, it's about a $200 um, expense um, added on to, to your toxic baiting. Um, the second conclusion is that migrating birds uh, were, were at the most frequent risk of um, exposure to dropped bait. And so uh, we think that we should deploy toxic bait during seasons when migrating birds are less present. For example, what we saw in July in Northern Texas is a bunch of those um, birds that we were having trouble with in March, like the white crowned sparrows and the dark eyed juncos, they weren't even present at the bait sites in July in Northern Texas. And so that's a really good time to, to be toxic baiting there. Our next steps are um, to, uh, we're applying for an experimental use permit. It's, it's um, the EPA is reviewing our application right now. We're hoping to hear from, from them really soon. Uh, for data submission to try to register hog on um, in the United States. Our plan is in July of 2021, so in, in just a couple months, um, we're going to bait 10 bait sites in Texas. And then in August of 21, we're going to do 10 more bait sites in Alabama. We're going to put GPS collars on pigs to make sure we can get a really good measure of lethality. We're also going to put some on raccoons and possums to um, make sure we know what the hazards are to those species. And we will be using the scared answers at every single base site. Um, if all goes as planned, which is kind of a scary thing to say because it doesn't seem like much has gone as planned. Um, but we feel like we're we're making we've made good progress. Um, and if all goes as planned, uh, Hogon could be registered as early as 2024, after um, the EPA takes time to review our data. And so with that, uh, I'm going to try to log in um, during the session, uh, and, and I sure would be happy to take any questions you might have on this work. Thanks a lot for watching.